Hey everybody and welcome to today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. Now today we're talking about getting started with Amazon ECS and Octopus Deploy. However, before we get into today's topic, there's some housekeeping that I want to go through with you all. Now there's no need for you to actually record anything or potentially take notes because what we'll be doing in a few days time is actually sending you the recording of this webinar. So watch out for that hitting your email inboxes in a few days time. Now we're looking forward to answering your questions and there'll be a section at the end of the webinar where we'll have time to answer those questions. So make sure you are submitting them for us. Now there's a couple of ways you can submit them. So you can head over to our Slack channel. So if you head over to octopus.com slash Slack and then enter into the webinar channel, we can take your questions there and we can answer them. Alternatively, if you're joining us on Zoom, please use the Zoom Q&A functionality and we can address your questions there as well. Last bit of housekeeping is we will be asking for some feedback at the end of this webinar. So again, if you're in the Zoom, you'll get a small pop up that asks you to fill in a feedback survey. And that's really just to help us understand if the content we are presenting to you in these webinars is, is on point and you're enjoying them. And if there's anything that we can do in the future to improve them. So it's really in your benefit to fill in that feedback form for us. Now, I think that's all the housekeeping that I have today to cover. So I want to start um, and introduce our guest today, and that is my colleague, Pete. Pete, welcome to today's session. How are you doing? Hey, Sarah. Yeah, good. Excited. It's an interesting topic, this. So um, yeah, a uh, whole heap that I've had to learn to get to this point. So yeah, I'm excited to, to, to teach people what I've learned. Awesome. And this is your first webinar at Octopus, isn't it, as well? So yes. um... Exciting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. It's all new. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really looking forward to hearing your um, session today and learning more about Amazon ECS, if I've got that right. So um, what I'll do is I'll hand over the stage to you, Pete, and you can get started today. Thank you very much, Sarah. Yeah, so um, as Sarah said, this is my first webinar for, for Octopus Deploy since I joined them. So uh, yeah, this is all uh, quite new to me, uh, but it's all exciting stuff. Uh, so yeah, today's webinar is all about uh, Amazon Elastic Container Service or, or ECS um, uh, and how we can use that with Octopus Deploy. So yeah, uh, it should be really interesting. So um, I'll give you a brief introduction first about what Octopus Deploy is. And we're also going to be using uh, runbooks. And so I'll talk about how we can use them. Um, ECS itself is uh, predicated heavily on containers, of course. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction to to what uh, Docker containers are, uh, and then we'll we'll leap into uh, what the uh, Amazon Elastic Container Service or ECS actually is, uh, and uh, what the component parts are. Uh, and then uh, I'll give you a brief system overview, just so that you can see what it is that we've got built up that I'll be demoing. Um, and then, of course, we'll have the demos, which are going to be uh, pretty exciting. There's quite a lot of hands-on stuff here. We'll be we'll be running stuff up and deploying stuff as we go. So, uh, yeah, you should get a good overview of what it is we're doing. Uh, and then once that's all finished, I'll come back and give you a recap of, of all the steps we've been through and some of the highlights to take away. Uh, and then we'll have some Q&A. So quite excited to uh, listen to your questions and absolutely do, do post those and we'll, uh, we'll uh, do our best to answer them. So what is Octopus Deploy? Well, it forms part of your CI CD pipeline. So it, it pretty much sits after your build server. So something like Jenkins and Azure DevOps, GitHub Actions. Uh, and then we handle all of the deploy steps after that. Um, uh, there's so many good reasons to talk about Octopus Deploy, but what it gives us is the ability to be able to automate those repeatable steps. Uh, and every time we create a release and deploy it, it should go through the exact same steps every time and we get a repeatable process. Um, we have releases, which allow us to be able to manage all of our releases when we did them, what we released at the time. Uh, and then we have the deployments, which go ahead and, and deploy our applications out to whatever infrastructure we like. Uh, and then we've got runbooks as well. Um, now, I'd like to talk a bit more about runbooks. Um, they give us this way to be able to separate out the operational tasks that are out of a normal deploy process. So... Um, they're, they're held within projects, but they don't run as part of the deploy. And some of the things that you can imagine we do under these circumstances is maybe seed a database with data, or maybe uh, stand up the infrastructure that we need uh, just once. Or maybe there's some maintenance task that happens. Maybe a health check fails on a VM, uh, and we'd like to, to restart that VM. And we can go in and we can just run these tasks as a one-off. 
So yeah, probably an underappreciated feature of, of Octopus Deploy actually is something that's that's super powerful. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, Elastic Container Service (ECS) is predicated on Docker containers, so it's only good that we go through and have a quick discussion on them. But Docker containers are a standard. A unit of software. So what we do is we wrap up the the code and the uh, infrastructure together. Uh, and what that means is that it's repeatable regardless of where we deploy it, whatever infrastructure we put it on, we should get the same result every time. So it, it just gives us the, the benefit of not having to worry about how it's running. Um, they're lightweight and standalone. So they're supposed to just run all on their own uh, and only contain what they need to be able to do that. And the reason being is that we need to be able to stand them up and tear them down at will, uh, and that helps us with scaling. And so that gives us this idempotency potency that we need uh, so that we get this repeatable container every time we run it. And then, of course, the subject of today's talk is uh, ECS, and so we need to dive into that a little bit. Um, ECS is a container management service, so much like something like Kubernetes, um, this actually came before Kubernetes and allows us to be able to manage containers at scale. So this is things like uh, deploying many containers and scaling them, pulling them down, uh, versioning them, and things like that. Um, as it came before Kubernetes, I actually find it to be a simpler service than Kubernetes as well. So as to something to bear in mind. Um, under the hood, there's a couple of different ways that we can run uh, ECS. We can either deploy directly to EC2 instances if we like, or we can use a service called Fargate. Uh, the benefit of Fargate is, is that this is a serverless solution. So instead of us having to, to manage the EC2 instances, instances, keep them patched and running, Fargate does all of that for us. And all we need to do is just tell it how much resource we need, uh, and it goes ahead and, and worries about that for us. Uh, if we went down the EC2 route, that's great. You get more configurability. But with that, there's more management overhead and likely more cost as well. So that's just um, the difference between those two. Uh, as it happens, everything we're going to do from the Octopus Deploy side will be using Fargate as well. So that's a, another good reason to use Fargate. Um, as well as Fargate, we'll be using something called CloudFormation. And this is AWS's answer to infrastructure as code. So uh, we're able to then create templates that will spin up all of the infrastructure. And we can... Uh, check those templates into source control if we wish uh, and, and keep that versioning history. But we can also create cloud formation templates and use them in steps in Octopus Deploy runbooks to be able to then stand up our infrastructure that way. Um, the great thing about ECS itself is that it's got a first party step in Octopus Deploy. So instead of us having to do all of this manually, we've got this opinionated step in Octopus Deploy that gives us everything we need to be able to deploy our containers across to ECS. So I thought it was a good idea just to, to give you an idea about some of the terms that you'll see as we go through this. And uh, we, we have ECS as a service, and within that, we've got clusters. And if you imagine clusters are a way for us to be able to group um, primarily an application together. And within a cluster, we have a service, and that service's responsibility is to stand up a task which contains our containers. So the service's responsibility is literally just to make sure that it can uh, find the task. And if it can't, then it spins it up. And then the task itself uh, houses our containers uh, and the infrastructure within it. Of course, we can have more than one container within a task. And we can have more than one service and more than one task there too. So this is how we'd go and split perhaps um, a, a microservice-based infrastructure up. Of course, we can have more than one cluster as well and then uh, ad infinitum across the way. Uh, so you'll see these these terms as we go through. Just to give you an idea of, of what it is that we'll be demoing today, obviously at the middle of it all is ECS. Uh, we're going to be using Fargate, um, the, the serverless opportunity that gives us for that, but you could use EC2 just as likely. Um, on the left-hand side, we've got Octopus Deploy and Runbooks. Uh, and for the Octopus Deployment, we are going to be going through Docker Hub, um, and that is going to pull down some images that I've already published up to uh, a temporary repository up there in Docker Hub, uh, and then allow us to be able to, through cloud formation, deploy that out to ECS to be able to run our containers. 
Uh, and likewise, uh, Runbooks at the top, there's a couple of uh, cloud formation scripts in there that allow us to be able to stand up uh, a couple of bits of the infrastructure within our system as well. Now, obviously, we're talking about containers, and um, it is possible to run a database in a container if you really wanted to, but we're, we're in a, a perfectly hosted cloud platform here, so we don't really want to be managing our own SQL Server container, and if we pull it down, what happens to the storage and considerations like patching and, and stuff like that. So we're going to be using something called RDS here, uh, which is uh, Amazon's relational database uh, service. And that allows us to create a SQL Server database within that. Uh, and uh, that's Amazon's responsibility to look after the patching and upgrading and uh, keeping that thing secure. So uh, this is a highly available instance we can spin up if we want to. But uh, it just takes away that, that uh, issue of managing your own SQL Server. We're also attaching a load balancer. Now, I've pre-configured this, so it's not going to be part of the demo. But um, obviously, this is best practice because when we want to scale this thing, then we're able to. Uh, we can have as many instances as we like, and the load balance will take care of that. But the benefit to me is that it gives me a static address that I can go to. Uh, every time we uh, update our application, the tasks get torn down and, and remade, and we lose the IP address. So it just makes my demo a bit better. So on that note, we should dive into the demos. So what I'm going to do is give you first a sneak peek of the application. So uh, I have many tabs open, but the first one here is the Octo Pet Shop. In fact, they're all Octo Pet Shop, but uh, this one is the one that I'm running locally. So what we have is a selection of lovely animals here that are living, in this case, in a local SQL Server instance that I've got spun up on my, on my machine here. Uh, and they're being pulled in so the web front end can show them. And then we can add them to the cart if we like and let that go through. And then at that point, we can submit and finish. So there's not a huge amount to this. Um, but if you imagine um, that you could break up the tasks that have just been through there into uh, separate tiers, uh, and that is, in fact, what we've done. So if we uh, just have a look at the right-hand side, and I zoom in, over here, we've got a set of projects. So um, just here is the database project. Uh, and actually, it's, it, the name's a little bit confusing. This isn't a database. What this does, it populates our database for us. So it's using DB up, and it's um, creating tables in our database and uh, seeding it with some of that sample data that you could see. Then next after that, we've got a product service. And the responsibility of this project is just to um, go and grab the products from the database, format them correctly, and allow the, the web front end to be able to then display them. Uh, next up, we've got some tests. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the tests, but every good solution needs tests, of course, so we must make sure we've got that. Onwards from that, we've got a shopping cart service, and when I added my product to the cart, then we were able to uh, maintain that state through that page and then back out. So that's that responsibility. And then finally, we've got the web project, and that is the part that's giving us our front end. So you can see we've got uh, four components, five if you include tests, but I'm not going to, uh, that uh, go into making our multi-tier application. So if we come back out of that. Um, I'm actually running this locally. So that instance you can see here is running on port 44348, and that's using IIS Express uh, and a local SQL Server instance that I've got run up. Uh, which is which is great for just debugging, um, but that's not helping us with containerizing. So what we can do is if I stop that application now, uh, if I drop down my uh, list of startup projects, I could choose Docker Compose. What we have on the right-hand side here is a Docker Compose project in Visual Studio. Uh, and within that, we've got a YAML file that describes how we can take uh, the, the Docker files that we've got and then stand that up into a local Docker desktop instance that I've got running. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start that, because that will take a little while uh, to start. And while that's going on, I'm going to um, run you through what's in the Docker Compose file and just give you a, an understanding of, of how you would do this without the, uh, the ECS step, essentially. So uh, that's all running up in the background, so I'll just leave that to it. Uh, this Docker Compose file... 
um, collects together all of what, what is named services, but there are containers that go into making this. And what you'll find is there'll be a container per project, and that's how, how I've architected this. Um, one of the real benefits of running locally and doing it this way is actually we don't need to have a local SQL Server install on our machine. We can actually pull down a container from Microsoft that's got SQL Server already set up on it. Uh, and that's that really helps not to pollute your local operating system. Um, and we, we can also then pull it down and start it back up again and, and not need to worry. Uh, further down below that, we've got uh, product service. Uh, so this is the first of our own containers that we're creating. And we can see we're passing in an environment variable there on line 16, which is the connection string to our database container. Uh, and then down on line 20, we've got um, the Docker file that we're actually using. And I'll go into the Docker file shortly, but I just wanted to, to take you through the rest of the YAML file first. Uh, next up, we're mapping a couple of ports. So on the left, we've got the port on our local machine. Uh, and on the right uh, is the port on the machine, um, uh, on the container itself. So we can see we're mapping port 5014 on our machine to port 80 on the container. Uh, and then that final line just means that we wait for the database container to start before we start this one. Scrolling down, we've got one for the shopping cart service as well. Uh, and we're passing in another environment variable there and the same mapping of ports. And then finally, we've got the web container of, uh, of any note down here. And we're mapping port 5000 to port 80 for that one. Uh, and we're passing in the URL of the two services that we need. Uh, these two URLs, by the way, they just map straight to the uh, the container name. So that's where that comes from. Uh, and then finally, at the end, we've got our database um, or DB up project. Uh, and that one is going to start just after SQL Server and populate our database for us. So that gives you an idea of what the Docker Compose uh, file looks like. And that uh, allows us to be able to collect together all our Docker images and then configure them. Uh, but that isn't actually creating the Docker container images at all. If I click the Docker for our web uh, project, uh, the first thing you'll see in this is that on lines 1, 5, 13, and 20 is that we've got from statements in there. And I just wanted to call that out before I dove any deeper because one of the things that we will do with Docker is that it, it's built up in layers for efficiency reasons. So you bring in parts that you think may not change very often in different layers. And that way, that if that part doesn't change, then that layer just isn't downloaded or uploaded anymore. So it just saves on transfer, makes uh, provisioning a lot faster. But right at the top, we're bringing down the ASP.NET um, runtime at this point. This whole application is a, an ASP.NET 6 uh, application. Uh, so we'll need uh, the runtime to be able to run it. Next up, we're actually bringing the SDK down because we're going to build the application in the container. And then you'll see that we then uh, create a publish of that uh, to create a DLL and we copy that to another directory. So uh, down on line 16, though, we're setting the URLs that we're going to run the application on. So this is going to be the same for the product service and for the shopping cart service. Uh, we're going to start uh, an ASP.NET application up and uh, we're going to then run it on a certain port, and all of them will default to 80 and 443 here. Uh, but you'll see it is possible, actually, to, to override that if we want to. Finally, we've got um, an entry point, which is just what the container is going to run. So that is the basics of those two files. And, and the reason why I wanted to show you them is because as we go through and we get all the way through to the octopus step, you'll see that um, there's some mapping between what we're doing here and what we're doing in Octopus Deploy. And it just gives you an idea of, of where these things are and why we're doing it. Uh, I can see that actually uh, that started up now in the background. So this is the previous instance that I had running there just locally. And this, if I refresh it, just to show you that there's no smoke and mirrors going on, this is the version that's just running in my local Docker um, uh, instance here on my Windows machine. So I can do all the same things. I can add a, a pet to my cart and submit and go through and finish. And so it works exactly the same, uh, only now we've containerized it. So we're, we're on a way now to be able to then lift and shift this. Uh, and using Octopus Deploy, we can, we can get that over to, um, over to ECS. So 
something I wanted to do first, though, is that um, obviously as part of this, I want to show you that we can deploy uh, container images, and I don't want to deploy the same thing. So I'm going to make a slight modification to the application, uh, and then I'm going to build the container images and then publish them up to the uh, the repository that I'm using. So if we return to uh, Visual Studio, I'm just going to add an another piece of text in here to say, please buy responsibly, uh, and then save that. So that's just going to change this one line in this one container. Um, and now I've got a couple of PowerShell scripts that we can use to build uh, our containers. Obviously, at this point, for any decent environment, you would have a build server doing this part for us, something like Jenkins or, or GitHub Actions. Um, but uh, I didn't want to overcomplicate the demo. So we've just got a couple of um, uh, PowerShell scripts here that will do that for us. Uh, and the only thing I need to pass in is the account uh, over in, in uh, Docker Hub that we'll be pushing this to. So I'm going to run this one up. So it's going to build the database image. And that's what that step is. And you can see when you're looking at it, the steps actually that it's going through uh, are very reminiscent of what we looked at in the Docker file. There we go. So that's the images built up for us nicely. Uh, and the next thing we need to do is publish them on out to Docker Hub so that Octopus Deploy can grab those images and then deploy them down to ECS. So I've got another PowerShell script that does that for us. Um, that just takes the account that I'm going to publish it to and a version number uh, to tag the images. So this will tag them and then publish them. Um, theoretically, of course, I could have just done the web project all on its own for this, but uh, I wanted to show you uh, the process of creating all of them in this particular instance. So this will tag the database image and then publish it. You'll notice as well the layers that I was talking about earlier in a second, where uh, you'll find the database project, all the layers will already exist. And here we go. So they already exist because uh, we've not changed anything in the database project. It'll be the same for the product, product service project as well. They already exist. And then our shopping cart service. Again, I, I could have just pushed the web uh, one here, but it kind of this just demonstrates um, uh, what the differences between these two things and how the um, this whole process is quite efficient, actually. You see, now we're pushing a layer, just that one layer of the uh, the, the web container, because we've only changed one part of it, and that's that process finished. So. That's given you an idea there, an overview of how we can start with just a local application and then move onwards slightly to running it in a local uh, Docker desktop environment. And then uh, after that, we made a change and we were able to then build new container images and push them up to Docker Hub to be able to use in a little bit. So the next thing I want to talk to you about is ECS, which is why you're here. So if I scroll across a little bit, and there we are. So if we go into the Elastic Container Service, what we'll find on this screen is the list of clusters that we've got deployed at the moment. And you can see that I've got two. So the first item on this list actually is one that I've deployed using the Docker command line. Uh, and when you do that, it's worth knowing that it'll deploy to EC2 instances. So you remember from the slides, we can either do EC2 or Fargate. Uh, so you can do all of this without Octopus Deploy, uh, but you're going to have a lot more overhead when you do that um, because it's, you know, you're going to be into managing your own EC2 instances. The, the, the cluster at the bottom here, though, is the one that we've deployed from Octopus Deploy. So if we go into that, we can see here at the top we've got a basic information about the cluster, um, including how many services we've got and how many that are running. And if I scroll down and pull this aside, We've got two services. And if you remember, the services responsibility is to start up the tasks that contain our containers. This first service, that's for our DB up project. So that's the one that's populating the database. Uh, and that's complaining because that's a short lived service. Well, at least the container is, it's within it. Um, and at that point, when it when it's it's deployed, it runs its, its tasks, populates the database and stops. So that's that's one of the reasons why I've separated it out into its own service. Below that, we've got the, uh, the the main service here. And if I click into it, and we've got one task and one running task. So that's good. Yeah, I'm happy with that. 
Uh, scrolling a bit further down, we've got the health of this particular service, and you can see there's a few peaks and troughs in that, and that's because I've already been pushing um, new versions of the containers and the tasks uh, out to uh, to this particular uh, instance. And so when it does that, it uses more resources, of course. Scrolling down, we've got a notification section. Um, and here, most of the time, it should just say that it's deployed and it's running fine. But if something's not in a ready state, then you can start your uh, diagnostics just by, by looking at this particular area. So if I scroll back up again, if I click on the configuration and tasks tab here, then we get a little bit more information about what's going on under the hood. So this top section, this is telling us what the task definition is. So as in, this is what we expect the task to have to do. Uh, and there's only one task in there, as it says. Uh, and then below is the actual task running. So two different things, and I'll show them to you. So the first one, the task definition, what you'll spot on this screen is something that um, if you use Octopus Deploy in their releases, then this will feel a little bit similar in that every time you push a new task to this, then it gets versioned. And we can actually choose which version we run when we do this. Uh, but for us, we'll just be running the very latest one. So clicking into that task version, uh, we get some more information about that particular task. So we can see we've got the network mode over here. Uh, and then we've got a task role and a, a task execution role. And there's a few things I'm not going to dive deeply into during this talk. And um, the whole security side of this, so IAM users and roles, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about, but you will need to set that up uh, before we can get any of this working. Uh, but there's a whole heap of documentation out there to let you, um, uh, you know, self-guide your way through setting up uh, all of the necessary roles and permissions that you need to do this. The other thing I'm not going to talk deeply about is the network infrastructure side. So we'll need things like security groups and load balancers and target roles. Uh, but again, there's, there's plenty of documentation out there for you to follow along. If we did, dove into that, we'd be soon out of time and you wouldn't see anything happen. Uh, so uh, on the right-hand side there over here, we can see we're running our app environment in Fargate. So uh, that then clicks with what we were talking about before. Down here, we've got the task size. So this is the overall size of the task itself. And don't forget, the containers are run by the task. So we've got three containers running in this particular task, the shopping cart service, product service, and web. So whatever you choose for that task CPU and memory, that must be enough for you to be able to run all of your applications, all of your containers underneath it. So just bear that in mind. If we actually go back a couple of steps, if we scroll down and I click on the running task, we can get some more information about what's actually been allocated to this task. So in this configuration section, we've got uh, the, uh, the operating system we're running on. And for us, that's x86 or x64. We can see again our CPU and memory. Um, the launch type of Fargate, um, the network mode is AWS VPC. Uh, we can also see the, uh, the ID for our network adapter. Uh, and we can see that there's a subnet ID there as well. So that's another thing that you're going to have to set up. And then on the right hand side, actually, we can see a public IP. And we can actually use that. So if I copy that, we can actually go and have a look at our local install. And in fact, that's the same address. So this is the Octo Pet Shop application running uh, in ECS. Uh, and that's using that um, uh, public IP that, that we've allocated. And in fact, what I've done, though, is set up a load balancer. And that gives us a static URL that we're able to uh, go ahead and use instead of the public IP address. It's worth knowing that when we push an update, it tears down the tasks and we lose that IP address potentially for that particular task, uh, and we need a new one. Uh, and actually, we'll see I've included some of that responsibility in uh, the Octopus Deploy steps to be able to handle some of that. Um, but the load balancer, that's going to be best practice anyway. So it's absolutely what we should be doing. So that gives you some idea of what ECS looks like under the hood. So what we need to do now is start talking about how we can deploy our containers to it using Octopus Deploy. So if I switch across to um, the, the webinar.octopus.app space that we have here, what I've done is create a project and a set of infrastructure to be able to allow us to deploy 
directly to ECS from Octopus Deploy. But before I start talking about it, the actual deployment process can take about 10 minutes. So I'm going to create this release and get that kicked off before I actually start um, showing you through the process. So to do that, we'll click Create Release. And what we see here is the packages that um, uh, it's found in the Docker Hub feed that I've already created in Octopus Deploy. And these are all at 13. And in fact, we can choose different versions if we want to. Uh, but I'm happy with that latest version of 13, Lucky 13. So I'm going to save that. And I'm going to deploy this. I can either click here or down below, but I'm going to deploy this to dev. I've not actually got a test staging or production environment set up at all yet. Um, I'm happy enough just with dev for this demo. So this gives you an idea of what's going to happen. And we can hit the deploy button. And then that will kick the deploy off. But I'm not going to sit and make you watch this um, and describe it while it's trying to do it. I'm going to take you through the process directly. So if I go to the process, then here are a list of steps that will uh, provision everything we need over in, in our already existing ECS cluster. The first thing we do here, actually, is, as I mentioned before, we've not got a, a database container spun up. We're going to you know, use the power of the cloud, and why not? So we've got an RDS instance and a SQL Server database in that. But of course, this deploy process doesn't know what that address is, and we shouldn't really be hard coding it either. So what I've got here is a, uh, a PowerShell script that uses AWS CLI, and it uses the, um, uh, the name of the database to go and find our endpoint for that RDS database directly. I'm not going to take you in dive, deep dive into that, but that's what that particular step is doing. Next, this step here isn't strictly necessary, uh, but the previous step grabs that endpoint and uses something called an output variable to be able to expose that to the rest of Octopus Deploy. And what we can do is we can then map a project variable to that output variable of that step. And then we can use that project variable through the rest of our steps. Uh, and this particular step here just echoes that out so that if something doesn't work, we can see why. Next up is the first of our ECS steps. Uh, I'm not going to dive into this one. I'm going to dive into the next one uh, because they're both the same and the next one's more interesting. But this first one, this is the one that deploys our DB or database or DB up container uh, that, if you remember, that populates our database for us. Uh, the step below is exactly the same. And this one is the one that's going to deploy our web, product service, and shopping cart service containers. So if we dive into that, um, the first thing you can see here is that we can deploy this to all of the different roles. And it's really important to know that, um, that we should be looking for flexibility in whatever we do in Octopus Deploy. And what we really want is repeatability and the ability to be able to deploy the same um, uh, infrastructure and deploy the same uh, code or, or um, set of resources across to exactly um, dev, test, staging, and production, exactly the same way that you would imagine that it would. So that, that's where that comes from, that particular part. Next up, you can see the first one of our project variables here, uh, and that's the task role. And I mentioned tasks when we looked at ECS, so I'm not going to deep dive into that. Uh, but I've grabbed that uh, ARN, and I've populated it into our uh, project variables so that we can use them here. Uh, and that's just allowing um, Octopus Deploy to assume a role with the necessary permissions to be able to do what it needs to do to deploy our containers. Next up, there's the platform architecture that we saw over in ECS as well at x86, x64. And likewise, there's our task size and CPU units. And it's worth reinforcing again that this is the task and not the containers we're describing here. So those values there must be big enough to be able to run your containers. Uh, I've only got three, so it's not a great problem. But if you had a lot, then you'd need to make sure that these were sufficient for that. Below that, we've got the network configuration. And again, this is something you're going to have to have set up beforehand uh, with the security group allowing us access to uh, our application from the public facing internet and the subnets uh, describing where it's going to be. Uh, we are actually setting that we want to auto assign a public IP. And that was that public IP that I was able to then copy and, and uh, show you the direct task uh, running rather than using the, uh, the load balancer there. Uh, we're not using tags, uh, but that's a good way of categorizing your resources together. 
And then the next section is uh, one of the most interesting parts because that is our containers. So we can see we've got three containers in here. We've got the web container, shopping cart service, and product service. And if I dive into the web container, then we can see how we go about defining what it's what it's going to pull down and deploy to ECS. Uh, I've variableized the name here. Well, theoretically, I could have just left it as it is. It would have been fine just being called web, but uh, I like to be able to give myself that flexibility to change it, and it changes everywhere. Uh, likewise, down here, we're actually setting up uh, beforehand a Docker feed. So this is to, to Docker Hub, um, and it allows uh, Octopus Deploy access to, to Docker Hub to be able to find all of our container images. And this particular container definition is grabbing the web container. And in fact, if we go to Docker Hub, uh, and in fact, if we refresh, we should see that all of this lot has been refreshed within the last few minutes. And there we are, so 14 minutes ago. And we can see we've got database, product service, and so on. And we're just grabbing that web one from there. Uh, a little bit further down, we've got um, our repository authentication. We don't need that. It's a public facing one. We're not bothered too much with memory limits. We are mapping the ports, if you remember from when we did it with Docker Compose. Uh, I want to be able to just hit that IP address or the load balancer address directly without having to put a port on the end. So that's why I've mapped ports 80 and 443. Uh, and then we're leaving pretty much all of this exactly as it is, aside from essential. And what this does, this just ensures that when this container runs, it stays running. And if it doesn't, then the task will get uh, torn down and there'll be some steps you'll need to take at that point. We're not bothering with the entry point command and working directory. If you remember, we defined them in the Docker container itself. Uh, we could use environment files here if you wanted to use source control for environment files. But what we're doing here is we're setting those using project variables directly in the environment variables. So we've got the product service base URL and the service uh, shopping cart service base URL there too. Uh, and the rest of all of that is just default. And we don't need to worry too much about that. So if we cancel out of that, that's pretty much how that top part works. Below this, we've got some health checks, but we've also got the load balancer settings. And this is remarkably easy. Once you've got the load balancer set up in a target group, uh, then we just tell it which container we want load balancer to point to and on which port. Uh, and uh, Octopus Deploy and uh, the load balancer in ECS just handle that for us. It's dead simple. Uh, and the rest of all of that is exactly the same. So I'm hoping that my uh, deployment has, has done, but uh, I'm not going to, to dive into that just yet because I wanted to talk to you very quickly about runbooks. So again, runbooks are a way for us to be able to run things like maintenance tasks that are out of the normal deployment process. Um, we've only got the one task here. Uh, and in actual fact, really, I should have a, a destroy infrastructure task there as well, um, uh, runbook there as well. Um, but I haven't uh, because I don't really need it for this. Uh, but if I go into the Create Infrastructure Runbook, uh, then we can go to the process for that. And you'll see that we have two steps in here. And both of them actually are using a built-in cloud formation uh, template step. Um, if we quickly go into that, what we're doing here is deploying our RDS SQL Server database. And if I scroll down, you can see that we've got some source code for that just here. Um, and I'm not going to explain what all of this is doing, but essentially it's spinning up a security group and a SQL Server instance, and it's taking a couple of parameters. What's great about these steps, and this isn't just this one cloud formation step, this applies to things like ARM template steps for Azure, is that if you've got parameters, then we get inputs for those automatically populated for us to be able to fill in. Uh, and I've used, again, project variables to be able to help us with that. So that's the RDS. Uh, SQL Server database we stand up. And then, of course, we'll need a cluster over in ECS. And so we've got a matching step for that uh, with some source code in there as well. Very similar, um, a lot simpler, that particular step, mind you. So before we have a look at what we've done, uh, finally, variables. So uh, project variables are great because then we can change stuff in here, keep it centralized, and it'll just map through to all of the uh, the, the project um, steps that we've set up for the deployment and for runbooks. You'll see at the top here, actually, I've got my AWS account. Really, this should be uh, in library sets rather than directly in the project. Um, but I don't have any library sets set up, and I've only got the one project. So I've put it in here uh, just for simplicity's sake. But in, real, in the real world, 
go ahead and put that in library sets. And that might apply to a few of the other variables as well. You'll see that some of these actually have got multiple different names. And the reason for that is, is that, of course, when we're deploying to our dev or testing or staging or prod environments, then we may well, and in fact, probably will need to have different names for those different um, services that we spin up. So that's what we've done there. So there's a few of them that have got different um, lists of, of names based on the scope that we're, we're deploying to. Uh, scrolling further down, you see we've got ARNs and everything set up down here. Uh, we can also put secure sensitive information in here. We can mark a variable as being sensitive. So it gets redacted in here and also doesn't get spat out into the logs in plain text uh, and give everybody your database password. So with that, we need to find out if our deployment has worked. So let's go back to the overview. And it looks like it's still going, which is a good sign. We've not got a red cross. So let's go into that and see where we get to with that. So it looks like we're, we're just waiting for the final step to complete, which that's OK. We can live with that. And if we scroll down a little bit, we can see that uh, we acquire some packages just to make this process work. The first thing we do is grab the RDS endpoint. Next, we grab uh, we, we spit out the RDS endpoint out of our project variables as we've mapped it. And then after that, if I just scroll down to this list, we can see we've successfully deployed the, uh, the DB up container in its own service, as I said. And now what we're doing is waiting for uh, our update to complete on the ECS cluster. And normally this would complete any time around now. So if we just give that a second, and that should complete. Uh, so that's all finished. So actually, if I expand this one at the bottom, we can see here that actually we've got a new IP address. Uh, we do end up with two sometimes. So it's kind of look at the draw. And the reason for that is, of course, it's tearing down some infrastructure and standing it back up. So you've got this overlap. Uh, but if I go back to our local host, let's try this one and see what that does. There we are. And there, look, see, we've got our new please buy responsibly paragraph that we added there. And please do, because, you know, uh, pets are for life and not just for this single deployment. So uh, we can also make sure that uh, we've got that in there. And in fact, please buy responsibly. We can see that, that we've got a nice uh, extra paragraph in there and everything, of course, still works. We can add stuff to it, submit it, and away we go. So that's the end of the demo. And look, it all worked, uh, which is uh, super impressive. I'm happy with that. So if we go back to the slides, there we go. Um, what we've seen here is that uh, obviously we had some slides at the beginning where I explained uh, how uh, all of this was going to hang together. But we started out in Visual Studio uh, and I was able to run that up locally with the local SQL Server instance. Next, we, sh we, sh we were shown how we could then Dockerize that and run it locally as well, uh, which was nice. Then I made some modifications to just the, the index page and we built the Docker images and deployed them to uh, Docker Hub for us to use. Then we went in and we had a look at um, the Elastic Container Service, or ECS, and we saw that there were clusters and services and tasks where the service, service was starting the task up and the task was housing our containers. Uh, and we dove in a little bit to see how those containers uh, were then being managed by the task in there as well. And then onwards from that, we went into uh, Octopus Deploy and we could see uh, we kicked off a release uh, and then in the background, uh, slowly, it was busy releasing our code into ECS. Um, and then at that point, we went through the process of looking at the fact we were able to detect the RDS endpoint, um, deploy our database, and then our web product service and shopping cart services as containers to ECS and find the public IP. Um, we also looked at how we can use runbooks to be able to stand up the infrastructure we need out of the deploy process. Um, and then finally, we looked at how we can use variables to make this whole thing configurable and flexible and repeatable. Uh, and that's about it. So um, yeah, uh, at this point, I suppose we can we can start looking at the questions that people might have. That was awesome. Thank you so much for that, Pete. Um, definitely learned um, a ton of things. Um, so we've got a few questions from the audience here. Um, you talked about the underlying architecture for this demo and you pre-deployed that for us. Could you explain a bit more about that for us? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I, I kind of mentioned it a couple of times while I was going through that um, you're going to need to set up security groups, for instance, um, because you'll need a way to be able to access your application from the public internet. Uh, and security groups are going to be able, uh, able to to do that for you. Um, there is a, a ton of documentation out there, and it's not really sort of in scope to go through too much of that for this particular um, talk. Uh, there's also the IAM side. So um, when we're deploying to, to AWS, Octopus Deploy is going to need the necessary permissions to be able to access uh, AWS. But on top of that, uh, the processes that go on within CloudFormation will also need access to be able to to assume roles and, and deploy infrastructure and things like that. So you'll need uh, an IAM user and you'll need some roles setting up to be able to, to manage that side of things. And in actual fact, it could, it could be that you, you need to assign too many um, roles to a particular user. So you, you could either have several users or actually create groups to be able to add uh, the relevant permissions to, um, to to that user. So, yeah, there's that. And obviously then there's the load balancer side and the network uh, that goes with it and target groups that go with that uh, to allocate uh, IPs and and make sure that the right services are hit when you when you hit the load balancer. So, yeah, there's, there's quite a bit that, that I didn't cover in there, but actually there are guides out there for those pieces. Uh, and I kind of just wanted to concentrate on the, the Octopus deploy and the ECS service itself. So I hope that sort of goes towards answering that question. Awesome. Yeah, sounds really good. Um, we've got another question here about the containers that you deployed. So you deployed three of the containers together and then one of them apart. Why didn't you do them all together or all apart, Pete? Yeah, that was, um, that was sort of a personal decision in a way, um, but um, th there's benefits to doing like three different ways. I add the database up, the database container all on its own because that, that service just dies. And when it does that, um, it, it affects then the logs that go on because when it dies, it says it's died. And uh, actually, if you deploy a container all on its own, it needs to be essential. So the task complains and you sort of saw that in the UI. So I just didn't want a dying task in along with the long running um, tasks or, or containers that, that I had deployed there for the web product service and, and shopping cart service. But it, you could have, in theory, deployed them all separately as well. Uh, but uh, the issue with doing that is then you've got to deal with the networking side of these things. Actually, when you when you deploy them all together, they all sort of run in the same service, the, the same container, the same underlying infrastructure is probably a better way of putting it. Uh, and so um, all the ports are available to all the other uh, containers. So it makes the networking a lot easier when you do that. And the database one, it starts and stops. I don't need to be communicating with it. So it just sort of made sense structurally to do it that way. Um, it's going to be entirely up to you and your application in the end, really. Awesome. I guess it's one of those things, there's multiple ways to do it. And then once you've done it the first time, you learn how to maybe be more efficient or how to make it better um, as you kind of deploy it multiple times. <laughs> well, yeah, and I'm, I've deployed it many times, many different ways. I, I tried it the individual container individual task way, uh, actually, and then um, found it easier just to put them all together. But there's there's downsides with that, of course. You've got to make sure that yeah. when you expose your ports, you expose different ports because you can't expose 80, mm -hmm. uh, port 80 three times because you can only do it once. There's only one port 80. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's internal things that you've got to do, but that's easily configurable. Awesome. Um, now, let me make sure I read this out because someone's asking what the difference between ECS and EKS is and why you would use ECS instead of EKS, which is not easy to say all those acronyms. <laughs> yeah, it's full of acronyms, isn't it? It seems as though that's all we deal with these days. Um, yeah, so uh, ECS, Elastic Container Service, and uh, EKS, Elastic Kubernetes Service. So they're, they're the two uh, acronyms that I've deacronized there. Um, so ECS is a far simpler service uh, than EKS, essentially. There's a, there's a downside when you do that, of course, in the EKS, the Kubernetes equivalent, that, that's more powerful, essentially, but it's going to take you a lot more management to be able to deal with, with the underlying uh, structure of what you're doing there. Um, for, for me, it was just easier. Um, actually, when I looked at it, the two services ECS were simpler to get used to. Um, the, the, there's a real downside to ECS, mind you, in that this is a, a proprietary AWS service. Whereas Kubernetes, you've got the whole um, uh, open source um, uh, um, 
folk around you to be able to help you with that. So there's a community around uh, Kubernetes that's fantastic. Um, there's more cost with the EKS. Um, ECS, you don't pay anything. You pay for uh, you don't pay anything for the service itself. You pay for the compute that you use underneath it. Whereas there's a uh, there's a cost per I think pod um, that that goes along with your EKS service. So there, there is an associated charge as well. Um, but but for me, I like things to be as simple as possible. Certainly, if I'm going to demo it, so yeah, ECS uh, for me. But uh, watch this space because there is likely going to be some EKS con content coming soon too. Awesome. Um, we've got another question here, um, and I'm not sure if you've got much experience of this, Pete. But the question is: Would it take many additional changes if we decided to use ECR instead of Docker Hub? Yeah, another acronym, ECR. So that's the Elastic <laughs> Container Registry, um, which is the equivalent of, of Docker Hub over in um, in AWS. And in actual fact, I think it might be slightly easier to do it that way because everything is then together. Um, but you're right, I've not spent much time in ECR. Um, I've done a little bit of uh, Azure Container Registry as well. Um, and so, yeah, generally when you're using services within the same uh, cloud provider, then then things are slightly easier. But the way that we've got this set up anyway, um, we would probably have to add a feed in Octopus Deploy for uh, ECR to be able to pull from. But actually, the, there may be a way that you could sort of shortcut that step and, and have it done directly within cloud formation, maybe. But I think actually this gives us some benefits to have it all separate anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, Docker Hub's a, a big provider of, of this. Uh, I know they've gone through some changes recently, but uh, it's still one of the best out there. Yep. Awesome. Um, if we wanted to scale this up vertically or horizontally, um, what what would we do? And is that possible? Like, yeah, I've not spent a huge amount of time doing that actually. But this is one of the reasons why I did the load balancer on the front because that instantly gives us this ability to be able to then um, add more um, services and tasks and containers along the way, and let the load balancer, with some configuration, of course, deal with that. Um, and also the benefit of using something like RDS um, as, as our service rather than, say, a SQL Server container, uh, because that, that automatically gives us that scaling uh, and we don't need to, to worry ourselves too much. Again, with using Fargate as well, uh, that scaling is, is a lot easier than if we we're using EC2 instances. Um, and my experience level tops out a little bit at, at that uh, because I've not done um, sort of corporation size deployments in this but absolutely um yeah that that load balancer is key uh, and you should always think about adding one of those uh, to anything like this because it just gives you that flexibility going forwards as well as you know an address that you can hit every time rather than trying to figure out what the ip address is <laughs> awesome um now we've got another question here from um someone asking Potentially, if we can do a session for Terraform with either ECS or EKS via Octopus. So um, that's actually not probably a question, but definitely something we'll take on board. Um, so thank you for letting us know that suggestion. Um, we'll see if we can try and schedule something in around that. Um, I think the last question probably, Pete, we have from the audience is, you mentioned there's lots of things under the hood that you've done and lots of decisions and probably learnings that you've done from trying to um, prepare for this webinar and session. So is there any chance of you doing a blog post or some kind of documentation to maybe share what you've learned in a bit more detail than we could have squished into this webinar? <laughs> yeah, possibly. Um, I mean, our team aren't sort of in charge of doing the blog posts directly. Uh, but one of the things that's most certainly on my list of things to do is that when I was showing you the run books, it was only really spinning up a couple of things. Uh, so what I want to do is, is uh, add to that run book process there so that we can spin up most of what I uh, showed in the demo automatically because it, you know it's great for people to be able to take this and just run it and see everything running without having to do perhaps some of those extra steps. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to have to add uh, the roles, uh, probably not the main user, um, but certainly uh, the, the load balance of target groups, security groups, and, and those sorts of things that just was sort of, it would have added too much complexity to add that, but it's it's something I most certainly want to do. Brilliant. So I think we're at the end of all the questions. Um, so thank you, Pete, 
for your time. Also, thank you to our attendees. Um, if you're not already an Octopus customer, please do reach out to our customer success team. They'll be happy to help um, answer any questions about how you can start to use Octopus in your environment. Also, if you are an Octopus customer and you want to dive into more about what we've done today, um, if you maybe have any questions, please do reach out to our advice team. They're happy to answer any questions and walk through any scenarios or problems that you're having. So that's a great resource for you to tap into as well. Now, if you haven't already, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel. We have great content out there. We've got lots planned for the next couple of months. So definitely hit that subscribe button over on our YouTube channel as well for future content. And last but not least, again, thank you for attending, everybody. What we are doing in our next webinar is actually talking about AWS um, CloudFormation and doing some automation around that. Um, so myself and Derek will be diving into that and, and I'm probably maybe looking at some of the questions you might have had around um, what we did here as well. So, yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed this. And, yeah, thank you for um, attending, everybody, and hopefully catch you again.